Stop Blair Witch Project, Ms. Heather Donahue and Mr. Michael Williams. So, for the start, um, we have to talk about the Blair Witch Project, of course. Uh, when it all started, uh, I think it. Uh, can can you tell us how the whole project came together? I, I can remember that it all started on the internet, and people were clicking on a page, and later there was this movie. And uh, can you tell us how you? Uh, created this project, how you made the movie, and how it all came together? That's a big, that is a big question. So, uh, we, we were not the filmmakers, we were the actors in the movie. We were cast out of uh, an open call in New York City. The three of us, Josh, Heather, and I, over the course of about three weekends of casting, um, we went down to Maryland and shot the film in about 10 days, we learned how to use the equipment, and we shot the film while the filmmakers uh, shadowed us in the woods. We had handheld GPS devices, and the filmmakers had previously gone out into the woods and planted certain waypoints for us to come across, like the sticks hanging in the trees, uh, the cemetery, things like that. And we knew that at every waypoint there would be an event, so we would program in waypoint three. It would tell us waypoint three is 4.5 kilometers away, northwest. So we would hike northwest, and we would come across an event. Um, either the filmmakers doing something to us in the woods, or the stick men hanging. We would have to react to that event and film it. Um, and overnight, we would put the, tape, the tapes in a milk crate. The filmmakers would take the tapes out of the milk crate and watch the tapes overnight to see where our characters had gone and then they would direct us from those notes to see where the dynamic of the film was going. The internet thing is like a whole other level of what happened with the film. This film can't happen today. It happened at the perfect time of the internet happening to be in its infancy, and filmmaking with a handheld camera had never really happened before either. So when you put the two of them together, uh, it kind of created a perfect storm because people believed what they were seeing. Now, if you saw something like that on the internet, because we're also internet savvy, you would know that this was not real. But back then, if it, the internet said this is real, you think, okay, it's real, because the internet is brand new. So that's kind of how that kind of came together. Not much to answer for you. <laughs> so, uh, you said you were uh, cast for the movie. Uh, uh, can you tell us how you both prepared for the roles? Because it was different, uh, the style was different, it has never done before. It created, uh, uh, let's say, lost footage, uh, lost uh, or found footage movies, and uh, people hadn't seen uh, something like that before. So how did you prepare for the roles? Well, that a little too close. Um, well, for me, they told us that they were going to be concerned about our safety, but not our comfort. And one of the producers was in this army survival course that he was modeling the shoot on. So I, I was actually over prepared because that's kind of how I roll. So I had, I mean, I was prepared to like skin a squirrel. I had purchased a hunting knife. I had some mace. Because um, everybody that I knew was like, you're not really going into the woods with two guys to shoot a film where no one can hear you screaming, are you? And I was like, yeah, that's totally what I'm doing. My mom said, I want their social security numbers, I want to know their, at least their last names. And so uh, the preparation, I think, was more about conquering fear and preparing for discomfort than it was about we obviously didn't have to learn any, any lines because we improvised the whole thing. So it's just about staying open and staying open to the innate conflict that the directors had set up in the casting. Yeah, I think the way I prepared was um, it was more about the experience 
once we got there because I think the first couple of days, I think the, uh, the work that we were doing, we were really starting to get to know each other and we had to play people that had already known each other. Um, so I, I don't even remember, I, if you look at the film, the first 20 minutes I don't say too much because the first couple of days I didn't say too much because I just didn't want anything to come, become inauthentic. So once I got very comfortable with the other actors, I felt like we formed this relationship. It was easier to believe in the circumstances once we were deeper into the circumstances. So the improvisation got stronger, I thought, as we went on and more believable. Anyway, for me it did. Um, so, you know, I was already versed in improvisation and they had created this, um, this stage for us to play on for eight or nine days. And, you know, it's never really happened before. And you could, you could shoot something and think, oh geez, that was terrible. And you'd stop and say, let's do that again. You could do that five times before you felt like, okay, that, that, felt, that felt pretty good. So it was very different than a regular film set. Um, so you were kind of preparing as you, as you went. You were really experimenting the whole week, is what you were doing. After the movie started in cinemas, it was a huge financial success. Uh, the budget was very low. Uh, when it was produced, so it was a huge success. What changed for you personally after the movie was released and you recognized, oh, uh, it is a great success? For me, uh, the movie was bigger than anybody ever expected it to be. The financial success of the movie, we didn't see that much of. We saw some, but we didn't see that much of, so it wasn't a big life changer for us as far as how we lived our lives. Um, the, the actual, what, more than the finances, the attention that the movie got was a life changer. You know, we went from basically not being known as actors at all to being on The uh, Tonight Show and flying around the country and uh, being on all different talk shows and uh, doing autograph signings and, you know, malls in America. And so it was a lot of attention immediately. Um, so that was the big, the biggest change was all of the attention. I, I wish there was a huge financial change, <laughs> as we all do, but um, you know, like I said, there was some, but not like a life-changing event. The more, more of the attention that the film garnered was more of a life-changing event for me. Yeah, certainly. I, my parents received sympathy card. My, my mom received a sympathy card of, we're so sorry that your daughter is dead. Um, so, it was a very effective marketing scheme. After the Blair Witch, Blair Witch Project, uh, did you uh, star in other movies? Uh, what projects uh, have you done since then and what are, the, are you doing now at the moment? Well, I, I did movies and a lot of comedies for a while. And then I decided I really, that was not what I wanted to be doing for the rest of my life. And I wanted to leave LA. So I burnt all my stuff in the desert and moved to the country to become a pot grower. Marijuana, like growing some pot. Um, then I wrote a book about that. It's a memoir called Grow Girl. And that came out last year. And then I lived in San Francisco for a while and I teach writing and things like that. And then. I decided I wanted to move back to the little town where I grew pot, but since I wrote a book about growing pot, I probably couldn't do it anymore, because it is still federally illegal in the US, even though it's legal in the state of California, which is kind of an interesting legal conundrum that we have around this lovely, helpful plant. And so then I started a business called Pretty Well, which is uh, basically a herbal, organic, personal care business. We have, a, we have a personal lubricant with a minty freshness, for all the genitalia. Um, we have uh, a, a, an oil-based serum, a hyaluronic acid-based sprayable serum, and a mood tonic called Mojo, a cleanser called Buff. It's lots of fun, come see my Etsy store. Growing all the time, I do a lot of wholesale orders. I could ship, I'm willing to ship to Germany, I'm there, I love it here. <laughs> love doing, doing the in-store demos down at the Aldi or something, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. I, uh, I did so I did a, a bunch of acting over the la over the ten years following Blair Witch Project. Uh, ultimately, I started teaching acting and found that I really enjoy working with kids. So I actually now I'm a school counselor. I'm a guidance counselor in a school, 
uh, at, back in New York for kindergarten through eighth graders. And I have two kids of my own, and um, you know, life is very fulfilling. I'd like to start a theater company once I get rooted in my new career a little more. It's only been about four years. That sounds um, nice. Yeah, so, you know, I, I definitely took a different path, um, but uh, it's been a fun one. So you said you had to uh, improvise a lot when you shot the movie. Can you give us a, a little bit more details about uh, how it was done, how it was shot, and how long it took to make the movie? We shot, we shot for about a week, and it was basically, uh, as Mike explained, we would have these little canisters that would have our characters' initials, or it would be H, J, and M, and we would have to open them up and there would be instructions for a scene inside, like, for Mike it would be like, don't let Heather have the map today. And my instruction would be, whatever you do, get the map from Mike today. <laughs> so it all automatically set up this inherent conflict that we would build a scene around, but we didn't know what the other had. So we would just kind of roll with it. We would just start trying to fulfill our objective and that was creating conflict with the other character and then you have the scene. Yeah, the, the improv, uh... A lot of it came from the canisters, and as I said, they watched the tapes overnight, so they knew where our characters stood with one another. So they would they would say, oh, "Okay, cool. Mike and Heather right now are getting along, so let's have notes for them that create conflict." Or Josh and Heather are not getting along, so let's try and let's try and get them on on the same page because they're fighting too much. As a matter of fact, Josh and Heather's relationship was so. Uh, like volatile. this, volatile, that I was supposed to be taken out of the tent first. I was supposed to be out, Josh was supposed to be at the very end of the film standing in the corner. But because their relationship was so volatile, the directors decided overnight, we're not going to take jo uh, Mike out, we're going to take Josh out. So that morning I woke up and I was like, wow, Josh is not and I'm still here. I guess I made the cut here. So interesting that we all kind of rolled with how it was working while it was working. What do you both uh, think of the sequel, Blair Witch Project 2? I've never seen it. I, uh, I thought they did, um, I thought they should have, they used Joe Berlinger, who's a you know, famous documentary filmmaker, and he really didn't make a documentary. The, um, the studio got too involved, I think they kind of rushed it. Um, you know, they tried to catch light, lightning in a bottle two summers in a row. That film came out literally one summer after. I thought they kind of rushed it. Uh, I thought the actors did a good job. I just thought it was it was more of an actual film, so it didn't really follow in the light in the spirit of the original film. It was like almost a completely different type of a thing. So I have to check if we have uh, questions from the audience. Questions from the audience. Agnes in publicum. They're very quiet. Why are you so quiet? Maybe they're tired. Yeah, I understand. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, no question? Wait. There's a question over there. Come so. Okay. How oh, you are quiet. Is it because it's cold? You feel constricted? Like, what if you have to stretch it out? Like, oh! <laughs> Go ahead and ask your question, because she's just going to keep stretching. How much time the day did you actually take footage so The way you're out of character, did you just take The question is, how many hours of day of the day like were we in character? We tried to stay in character 24-7. Uh, we did have to break a few times, and we had a code word. Uh, that taco. The, the code word was taco. Which was like, a, I had to say, if I said taco and the three of us were in the scene together and I didn't hear you guys say taco back to me, that meant that you guys were still in the scenario and I had to wait for you guys to hear that so that we all knew. Because it was confusing in the first few days, we didn't have any such word, but we decided let's all just be in character. And then at one point we were like, well how do we know if we're not being in character because so, so that we kind of, like I said before when we were improvising, it took us a few days to figure out exactly what we were doing. And the taco word became unfortunate because we were eating less and less. So now, day seven calling taco and you're starving is probably not the greatest word we should, probably should have used. Um, but we basically tried to stay in character 24-7. My feeling was 
the more I believe in the circumstances, the more the audience will believe in the circumstances. And people always ask, were you really scared? Were you really scared? And I say, you know, I hope so, because that's the whole idea. The idea is to feel real emotion when you're acting. So, yes, I knew that the filmmakers were shaking the tent in the middle of the night, but in my mind, I had to put that out of my mind and think about some crazy witch that was out there as opposed to thinking, oh, it's just the filmmakers, because I had to draw fear from somewhere. So, we tried to stay in character as much as possible. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Come on. We have room for one more question. I have a question. If I were to drink a German beer, which I will do tonight. Postwitz Schwarzbier. Yes. What is your recommendation? Schwarzbier. Anyone? Any beer drinkers? I know I know there's some beer drinkers out here. Really? This is a question that's not gonna get an answer? Are you Kronen. kidding me? What is it? Krone. It's like brown. Krone. Krone. I don't know that beer. Kronen. Kronen. Okay, thank you. But, yeah. Is that a pilsner? I'll look for it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll look for it. Dry, dry a Hefeweizen. Hefeweizen I've had Hefeweizen. in America. Something I can't get in America, that's what I'm looking for. Hefeweizen, Hefeweizen is very good. Yeah. When, when you drink a lot of Hefeweizen, right? Yeah. yeah. When you drink a lot of Hefeweizen, uh, you must remember the line, Wo is the toilette? <laughs> it means oh. where's the toilet? So, don't drink too much okay, Hefeweizen. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And so, um, I think our time is up. Aww. Oh. We have so many more questions from the audience, Rob. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we don't have questions anymore. So, are there any final comments? Anything you want to say or share with the audience? I also like cooling. Yes? <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Thank you guys for hanging out with us and, and stop by at the table and say hello. Thank you guys. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the cast of Blair Witch Project, Ms. Heather Donahue and Mr. Michael Williams.